Hi, my name is Hannah Jane Pritchett, current UA GIST master's student. Welcome to the University of Arizona GIST podcast. Our hosts are Jennifer Mason and Chris Lucanbeal. Today, our guest is Elspeth Hoggett, engineering draftsman at Tucson Electric Power. Let's get started. Hello, I'm Chris Lucanbeal, the director of the UA GIST programs. And on our podcast today, we have Elspeth Hoggett who is a graduate of the MSGIST program from the inaugural class of 2011, sometimes referred to as the, uh, historically, the, the best class, they like to say that, personally. <laughs> um, and Elsbeth also has one of the, uh, what, distinguishing UAGIST gossip characteristics of having had worked with our current um, instructional designer, senior instructional specialist, Andrew Grogan at the time when she was in the class. So as we like to say in Tucson, the GIST community is, is very small and we continue to um, encourage networking. Um, and Elizabeth is a good case in point of how those networks continue to, to help today. Uh, currently Elizabeth is with the um, Tucson Electric Power doing GIS work with um, um, other alumni, and um, we have Elspeth here today to talk to us a little bit about just her work as a GIS professional in the state of Arizona, and um, thank you for joining us today, Elspeth. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really glad that we were able to collaborate and do this after March Baptist, unfortunately, was canceled due to, to COVID. Yes, that's been a big change for us as well, too, and it'll be interesting to hear, um, you know, how that's affected you and your, your job and career, too. Yeah. And so I know we had, a, we had asked for the March Madness, um, we had a series of questions that we were asking people mm -hmm. to answer, and I thought maybe we'd just take this opportunity to ask some of those questions of you today. Sounds good. So... I can get started with the first one. I obviously know that you graduated from the program, mm -hmm. here, but um, I still want to know kind of about your GIS training. I don't know if there's other training you did before you started here, if you were in a GIS role, maybe your background, and I'd love to hear actually how you came to the field. It's always fun to hear because most people don't know what GIS is and they just happen upon it. So I just want to hear about your background. Yeah, so um, I graduated with a BA in geography from U of A in 2004 with a minor in geosciences. And I actually started as a poli sci major. And then my freshman year, I was taking one of those gen eds. And that was the first year that the ILC had opened. And so we we're in this, you know, big lecture hall down there. And I was taking it with my, you know, best friend and roommate. I was in marching band, by the way. So you might hear a couple marching band references. And she was in my section and we're sitting next to each other. And it was this geography gen ed that was team taught. There were three professors. There was Dr. Yule, Dr. Comrie, and Dr. Cupper. Um, and Dr. Cupper, I think now has, I, th I feel like he was at, um, now he's at the University of South Carolina, but you might want to fact check that. Um, and I was so into it. And, you know, they would, doc you know, Dr. Yule, he, throw out questions and I'd be answering them and it was, you know, everyone else just doesn't want to be there, you know? And I was like, this is so cool. And my roommate goes, you should, you should major in this. And I went, okay. So I went and talked to Dr. Uh, Cupper and changed my major literally, I think within a week. And from then on, it was, um, what did I really, I think my, like my first, like actual like real geography class was biogeography. And I really got into that. And then they had intro to GIS. And that was like a level 400 class. And this is probably going to date me. That's okay. Um, my first class was with ARC Info and, you know, the command-based, um, you know, uh, lab um, course. And it was really, really interesting. And I loved it immediately. And I was like, this is, this is what I want to do. I want to make maps. I don't know what of. I was, like I said, I had a minor in geosciences, and so I thought maybe I could come somehow kind of marry the two and thought maybe I would go into USGS or Forest Service. Um, ended up going into the defense industry, like you do, um, for a company called General Dynamics, which was here in town, and that's where I worked for uh, Andrew Grogan. 
for, you know, I was there for seven years. And then another person got hired on Melissa, now Janzik, who's also an alumni of the first the inaugural class. And now we work together at TEP. So when Dr. Lucamille says it's a very close community, of, it really is. Um, you know, most of the, or all the GIS jobs I've gotten have been as a result of networking and just, you know, kind of who you know. Um, so that's kind of how I got into geography and then GIS and then, you know, the GIS profession. And, you know, more and more now people kind of understand what GIS is. You know, COVID is kind of a horrible example, but when people look at the Johns Hopkins, you know, dashboard that they have, it's like that is, you know, using, you know, programs that, that I use in my, you know, daily job too. So it's kind of a way to tie, you know, the data plus the map together and say, yeah, this is what I do, but you can apply it to, to really anything. So that's nice to give people some context. I wish it was a better example. Yeah. So how did you transition from, um university or academics to the professional community did you have any um leads or was there a seamless transition or you know what was it, your experience so i actually did work study for um steve archer in the school of natural resources and one of his grad students also did gis and she had me mapping mesquite canopies for um some plots that she had out on the Santa Rita experimental range. And it just, honestly, it was timing. It was timing and the people that were already there working at GIS were classmates of mine in my undergrad, including, I got hired at the same time, this was in 2006 as Brian Thaxton. And we both got hired at the same time at GD. <laughs> everybody knows everybody, it's crazy. Um, and at the interview, this was for um, a program at the time called Urban Tactical Planner, and it's mapping um, urban landscapes, so, excuse me, urban landscapes, and uh, for different cities around the world for the uh, Army Corps of Engineers. And so it was basically just kind of um, extracting polygons, you know, drawing, you know, extracting cultural features and stuff like that. And so when I showed up in this interview and said, well, this is what I used to do at U of A, not really knowing that that's kind of the type of work that I was interviewing for. And they were like, oh, she's perfect. <laughs> and it just, you know, kind of fell into place. And then that, you know, we worked on other projects there, depending on the contracts that we had. But I found that going from academics into the professional world in that first job, you know, for me, it was honestly kind of just a place to grow up a little bit. And um, it was, you know, more of a relaxed environment so you know the transition for me wasn't so hard at least not from like a GIS perspective. So I'm curious you know as you moved through these different jobs now I see, mm -hmm. let's see I wrote it down you're an engineering draftsman at mm -hmm. Tucson Electric Power. It's a very official title yes. <laughs> so you know well for me and anyone else curious out there what does that mean you know what kind of GIS skills do you apply? What kind of projects do you have to work on as an engineer? So in, so <clears throat> at TEP, our main GIS software is not Esri. I don't know if anyone's ever told you guys that. Uh, we use a program called Small World, which is made by GE. So um, that is mainly what you know, of all of my, I'd say 90% of my work is based in that um, software program. And engineering draftsman is kind of an older, it's like a legacy title, basically from the days when they used to do their drafting, their mapping on giant mylar sheets with ink. And then you can erase it, you know, you get the eraser wet and you're, I don't know if you guys have ever seen that before or back in it's like some like museum somewhere. Um, and actually, until the pandemic hit, we were still doing that as a backup for our systems office. So, um, you know, kind of like the main control center where, you know, someone hits a pole and the power goes out. Um, that's the office that's kind of handling all of that. And we would, um, you know, do our changes in our mapping um, in the software and then make, uh, you know, the backup copy that changes to the Mylar. So that's where the draftsman 
term comes from, but what we do basically is we map all of our facilities, the electric facilities, overhead and underground, all the way from our 500 uh, KVA lines that we have going from Arizona over to New Mexico, down to the service that's either, you know, from the pole behind your house, overhead to your little weatherhead meter panel or underground, depending on what kind of, um, what, how your service is, is supplied to your house. Uh, we map all of those that are, you know, slated to go into service that are in service right now. If they make any changes, you know, open points, um, you know, if they're going to energize like a new substation, things like that. We are kind of keeping in touch real time with that systems control office that I had mentioned. So if they say, you know, hey, we energize this new subdivision because we're going to build a bunch of houses and we put in all the transformers, um, that's hot we make the changes on our end and then they can kind of build their outage management system on top of that. So it's a very close kind of one-to-one -one relationship. And then in conjunction with that, when the crews are out doing like a giant job, or if you've seen them, um, you know, let's see, well, we did the Overton La Choya, uh, uh public improvement. So that was one that people might've seen out there. Broadway, Grant, those widening ones where they take all the poles and they kind of move them to the where the new right-of-way is going to be. Giant projects like that, when the crews are done, you know, they have a paper map and they write all over it. This is what we did. It's called an as-built. That was a term that was new to me when I went into that job. Um, we get those maps back. Any changes that they make on there, we make sure go into our system appropriately. Device IDs, um, you know, poles in or out, you know, the topped poles which I don't know if you've ever seen those where it looks like a pole that they just kind of cut the top of it off with a chainsaw. And then you have the communication lines kind of down below. All these things I never paid attention to is till I started working for the company. And now Melissa and I are texting pictures of like, look at this weird substation in, you know, North Carolina. It's so weird. You know, anyway, I love what I do. That's, you know, what I, what I can say. So Elspeth, yeah. I, I think it's interesting that, the job that you currently have and the software you're the so, especially the software you're currently using <laughs> at your job has nothing to do with your past education except for maybe the way to think about it so, yeah and and that line like what skills did you find that helped to prepare you maybe out of the gist program or the university itself what, what skills help to prepare you to be able to take on a job where the software is new and, and you weren't trained to be able to use? That's a good question. So two things come to mind. First, I, the other 10% of what I do is Esri-based. Um, so we do use, um, you know, Arc Pro right now, which I just got the newest version of that on my computer and um, it's great. So you know, another part of our job is kind of fielding mapping requests from other departments. So right now with the Bighorn Fire, we've had uh, requests from our transmission, our veg we have a vegetation management department, um, and you know, HR, things like that, wanting a map of the fire perimeter when they, fi when they fly it every night to see, you know, the infrared spots and everything um, overlaid with our facilities, because we did have some areas that we thought, you know, we might have to de-energize, you know, take an outage for some of these places to help protect our assets. And then also, you know, um, you know, assets that we have in the kind of those ready, set, go zones. And so we do use Esri for those maps and we can put those together on the fly um, and then send those out to other, other uh, departments as, as they need them. Our kind of our team motto is there's a map for that. We have an embroider on the back of our shirts. I made it up. They made it a thing, whatever. Um, so the program, I think for me, really helped me, you know, interact with these departments and say, yeah, we can, we can do that for you, whatever, you know, you need. Let's see what we can do. Um, learning to work with different types of departments and different personalities I think that um, that has really, you know, helped us, helped me deliver a product to people that is actually useful to them. 
So kind of asking the questions of what, so you want a map of this. Can I ask why, why, you know, what are you planning to do with the information? And usually we can flesh it out from there and say, you know, well, would it help if we included these features? Or do you think, usually it's kind of talking people out of including everything in the kitchen sink, all in this one, you know, layout. And, um, or, you know, we can create a portal app for you and maybe this will kind of help you, you know, collect some data, things like that. So, you know, the, the program helped me be more, I think, really realize that this is like a, a profession. Because when I got into it, as you know after my undergrad it was like well this is what I do and then it was like well you know GIS has really changed quite a bit over the last you know 10 years or whatever however long five or six after I graduated um to kind of really see that this is a very fast growing field and there are a lot of different facets and so you can kind of really find a niche for yourself and find a way to help people solve their problems using you know data mapping I'm curious because you just brought up about how much the field has been changing, you know, the past yeah. 10 years. Five. Are there like yeah. skills or things that you've come across based on where JS is headed, at least in your career, or things that you've seen that you think would be really important for students or people entering the GIS field to really make sure that they have um, to be yeah. successful in their career? I think... Um, yeah, SQL, learning SQL queries, if you want to get super specific about it, um, is something that I didn't, I mean, I'm sure that we had like a lab on it or something, or maybe, maybe not in a while, but is something that is going on, you know, quite frequently. Um, and, you know, that's a big one, I think. And also, this is going to sound super dumb, you guys, but I think Excel proficiency is a big thing too. And I could, you know, get by, but my boss, sometimes she's like, oh, I made pivot tables and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, what? So it's kind of, um, I think, you know, Excel and other just kind of data, like data management or um, data analysis tools to, you know, are big. And I don't really know a lot of the specifics, um, but I think for me, those two, that I realized it's like, oh, I'm going to have to kind of brush up on this a little bit, um, you know, and depending on the field that you're in. So when I had my, so before I worked at TEP, I also worked on base with Jimmy Mack, Brian Thaxton, and Joe Case, who's actually an alum of Dr. Luke Beale's program when it was at ASU, right? Yeah, ASU. And um, we were working with massive amounts of imagery. And so that was something that I wasn't quite used to either. So I think they call it, is it with vector tiling? Is that, and that was something that I was starting to get into um, when I left that job and went to go work for, for TEP. So that's another pretty specific skill that I think um, would help people depending on the field that they're going in. I know that those are ones that I was like, oh man, you know, should have maybe taken an online class or learned about that a little bit more, but Esri makes it really easy where you can ask questions or, you know, take some kind of training. Google, Google's your friend. So you've now been in the um, Arizona GIS community or the profession for, for quite a while. Um, yeah. And I think as well as the technical skills that are there, you're a good example of, what we'd say for students to, to understand the importance of soft skills or of the, the professional skills that you need to continue to be successful in your career. Mm -hmm. The things that like, like the spatial thinking that you mentioned or the networks that we were talking about, but what have you found like in sort of like the professional skills that, um, that we kind of emphasized in the program when you were there and, and since then, and you and I personally afterwards, mm -hmm. um, did some, some work together in that area that might help students to understand the need for and, and how it's helped your career evolve. I am really, I'm a, naturally an introverted person. It might be kind of hard to believe, but I think the importance of, especially now in these days, 
the importance of a phone call because a face-to-face -face conversation might not necessarily be super, you know, realistic at this point, but even just Zoom something. Um, the importance of getting to know a, a person or what they do professionally and learning about what they do and just establishing that relationship, making an impression, even if it's just not even necessarily work related, but you know, just kind of, I'm not doing a very good job of it right now, but <laughs> you know, just um, have a meaningful interaction with someone. And um, my friend, she's from Arkansas. She always says lead with the sugar and not the spice. And I don't know if GIST exactly spelled that out for me, but um, that alone has helped me in every single job that I've had since I've really gotten to learn and practice that skill, especially in the job that I have now. There's, um, I work with a lot of <clears throat> grumpy linemen who, you know, they have a way they're going to do it and they turn in the map and I'm like, Hey, did you mean, you know, did you, did you do this one thing over here? And when you say you did change to cat gut cover and put on a pigtail and a chicken wing, can you just, can you explain that to me? Like what, how does that look in the field? Can you send me a picture? And um, what I realized is that people want to teach you and they want to show you what they do, especially the linemen, especially the retired linemen who are now in a leadership position. If I go down there and say, you know, can you show me what this looks like? Can you, can we go on a field visit and can you kind of show me how this is configured? and teach me why, why does it look like this? Why would you do this? I want to make sure that I'm doing right by you by making sure that I map what you did accurately in the field. Cause it's a safety concern. Um, or when I worked on base, you know, those, the pilots, um, that, that were training, you know, they're amazing people. And I wanted to make sure that I was doing the best job for them. So I'd say, you know, can you, can you show me how you would kind of fly this pattern or you guys talk about a pickle button that's literally a thing um and just teach me and that way you're kind of you take the pressure off of yourself to say oh, i have to know all this um but you're also kind of giving that person a time to shine and then i think that for me that's i just learned so much better when it's when there's context and um and then at the end of it usually we're both smiling and then when i go back and if i need a favor or hey you know i still had a couple more questions they're much more willing you know i think to to work with you on that and they know that you are there to help them and not you know just to be self-serving so i think you know when i was in the program i remember working with dr christopherson and i think did dr marsh come in i think he did a remote sensing unit and it was just always nice to have conversations and talk to them about, you know, how they applied, you know, these techniques and what they did and um, just getting to know them a little bit more. And then, you know, later on, it's like, oh, yeah, I remember you. How's it going? And, and it's just kind of about who you know and, and leaving a good impression. I try anyway. Yeah. Is that what you mean? Okay. Yeah. I was also <laughs> thinking, too, about... Um like you personally working the networks in between, like when General Dynamics pulled the contracts out of Tucson, how you transitioned yeah. so well to a new position. And that's well, a, that's a I, I did story. take a little bit of a break. I yeah. did work a stint in running retail for a few years, which actually is where I learned most of my people skills, where it's like, if there's a day when you're just not having it, but someone's walking in and they're not having it either. And then you got to, you know, work together and, you know, grumpy customers and everything. And, um, that was, you know, a job where I learned to pick up the phone, call people, don't just send an email and wait and then say, well, they never go back to me. You got it. Work it people. It's the only way. And then, yeah. And then that's, so then when I was like, I don't think I want to do this anymore. And I reached out to Dr. Luke Beal and I was like, Hey, <laughs> what's going on? And that's, you had just moved into the, um, the ENR2 building and it was really just kind of putting yourself out there and saying, Hey, I want to get back into this. And I was really, I was terrified. I thought, Oh my gosh, it's too late. You know, my skills are rusty. They're gone. This is never going to work. And thankfully that was not the case. And I got into just that amazing job at SimStar. I think they're called proactive now. Um, 
at DM, which that job, every job that I've had in GIS has been life changing, but that job was, oh man, I like Oprah ugly cried the day that I had to leave. And that was, and it was even my choice. But when I left, that was really, really, really hard. And then I just went into TEP, which has just been just as amazing, but on, on different levels. Mm -hmm. Um, working for, for that company, for TEP has just been uh, so great, especially in the, the days of this pandemic and what they've done for us. But I feel really proud, so proud to have worked for the companies that I worked for, for sure. So I actually was thinking, because you've had so much experience in a variety of positions and jobs, <laughs> um, you know, and we were really excited when we were putting on March Madness, we had lots of strong women in various careers all over Tucson and actually Arizona. Mm -hmm. I would love to hear like what your experience has been. Cause I think traditionally um, women have been represented in GIS and over the mm -hmm. years, and sometimes it's kind of an imbalance in certain fields. There's more women, maybe certain jobs that you've had, but what your experience has been over the past, what well, almost decade with all these different GIS jobs and, maybe how uh, the numbers have changed or the roles that maybe women have had in these different careers and what your experience has been as a fellow woman in a GIS career or multiple. So yeah, when I got first got into the field, it was definitely uh, male dominated for sure at my office. I mean, we had a handful of women um, and one of the senior, you know, um, I wish Andrew was here. Uh, he would, he would know um, what, her name was Roseanne, what, what her role was. Um, but you know, for the most, it was definitely, it was probably more like a, like a five to one ratio of men to women. Um, nothing necessarily bad, but when I did get to my job on base, that's where it was like, I was, you know, um, I think my official title there was like a, a programmer. Cause there was, I don't know why, but I basically just did, you know, GIS stuff, but I was one of three women in an office of maybe 20. So, um, and when you're on base and this is no disrespect, but you know, it's kind of sort of good old boys network ish. Um, and I didn't really let it bother me so much. I really, you know, and I don't know, you know, kind of now in, in, you know, this day and age, you know, it probably would have been a little bit better just to say, Hey, you know, maybe not, but um, I remember there was more than one instance where they were like, Hey, we're gonna, we have some visitors. Would you mind setting up um, a catered lunch for everyone? Like basically like administrative duties. And they would ask me because I was the woman, you know, in the skirt and you know, whatever. And um, that never really quite sat right with me. Um, but nobody ever really doubted my capabilities. I think generally as a professional, um, nobody was ever, you know, surprised like, Oh, woman, you know, this and that, except for when I would travel uh, maybe to other bases and would be in, um, you know, kind of like we would do these um, like uh, joint force, um, you know, kind of trainings or like exercise um, trial runs. So basically we'd all fly to Orlando and, you know, we, I was there representing the A-10, um, you know, and the, the visual modeler basically making sure that when all of these, so you have a, like a flight simulator sorry, digression, get ready. Um, you know, uh, the, with the flight simulator for the A-10, that's the program that I worked on and they would have the A-10 and then we'd have the F-16 and then you'd have, you know, the Marines were there with their, you know, virtual exercises and we would do this joint force, you know, like a rescue operation, but we'd all be remote, you know, so the, the A-10 pilot was actually on at DM, but he'd be dialed in on a secure location and then if there were any issues, I could kind of fix it on my end where we were all, you know, the programmers were in Orlando, if that makes sense. And I was there with, you know, another employee and he was kind of like on the, like the business, you know, aspect of it. So if they had any questions for the A10, they would ask him and not me, even though I was, you know, if there was any like a, like a visual, you know, modeling issue, like, you know, he's trying to fire, you know some type of weapon and a Toyota Tacoma is coming out, which actually happened not on my watch, but I, but I heard about it, um, would be something that I would fix. But, you know, I kind of just got looked past. Um, and you know, that's not super great, but, um, 
at TEP, they have really, they've actually formed a committee. It's called Women in Energy. And um, we have our, actually now we have the uh, vice president and our senior director. We have women in many, many senior um, director and senior management um, positions. And they really do try to promote this conversation about women in this industry, in the um, transmission distribution in industry, energy, just in general, where, you know, renewables. Um, it's generally a very male dominated um, field again. So they're really trying to kind of create a balance of, you know, making sure that women have a voice, that they have the skills and the training that they need, um, you know, to, to have positions in, in that company. And so I think it's really great. And I've never experienced any kind of, um, you know, disadvantage or any, you know, observation of anything like that, you know, because you're, you're a girl, you know at least in the GIS, you know, part of it. So Elspeth, being a successful graduate of the <laughs> MSGIST program and, and somebody that we can point to as, um, you know, what, what has worked, if you had some suggestions or recommendations for current students and future students on like how to make it in the industry as a, as a woman or as a professional in, in um, Arizona or defense industry, electric and power industries, you know, like what has worked for you and what would you recommend for future students to, to consider maybe both in class and outside of class? So in class, you know, foster those connections. Like, like I had said, um, you know, it, friendships are not, you know, LinkedIn is a, is a thing. But you never know, especially in Arizona, I feel like, or just in Tucson, you never know what thing is, is going to open up or what person you know somewhere like Jen Pasillas. I mean, I run into her at Mount Lemon. I see her at Zona 78. You know, she's also a fellow. Is she, she's involved in, you guys know who she is, right? Jen okay. Pasillas um, is part of the Tucson Pima GIS Co-op and then the Parks and Rec for the city of Tucson. Yes. Yeah. 2011 alumni. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, um, you know, and she was, you know, another person that, that I had reached out to, you know, and I thought I might want to kind of get back into the, into the GIS profession. And, um, so that's, you know, what I would tell people in the program now is, you know, get to know your fellow classmates, learn about what they do. If they, if they work in GIS and if they don't work in GIS, still learn about what they do. Um, get to know them. You just, you never know what is going to be further on down the road. Um, as far as, you know, outside of the program, I think that, and I've, you know, heard some, you know, cases where people just kind of get overwhelmed with the, you know, the prospect of going into this new role, especially with some of these, you know, with municipalities or other companies where they say, well, we need a GIS person. And then they hire one person and that's it. And, um, that can be really overwhelming. I know that would be overwhelming to me. And I actually got some really good advice from a fellow, <clears throat> excuse me, a fellow engineering draftsman from where I work now. They call themselves GIS mappers. I stick to the old school title because I like it. My boss, also a woman, she's like, we should just call it mapper. Fair enough. Um, so I had a conversation with someone because he could see that I was getting really just I should know this. And, you know, somebody showed me how to do it. And I should, you know, I should know how to do this. And he goes, will you relax? He said, nobody is born knowing how to do all of this. Um, we're all still learning. And at that point he'd been there five years. We're kind of a newer department. Um, we had a, a, a big chunk of turnover where we had people that had been there 35, 40 years, all retire within like a three to four year period. Um, and I wish that somebody would have told me that sooner, or it would have been nice to hear sooner, but at the same time, I'm glad I heard it when I heard it. And if you're just going out into the world, into GIS, feeling like you have to prove yourself and, you know, know that you have to know how to do everything all the time, all at once, that's not true. And, you know, it, it's, it's going to be you know, okay, 
which just sounds really like a like a platitude but it's the goal is to try to help you take some of the pressure off of yourself um especially if you're like i said if you're newer to the field um you know when i got into that job on base <clears throat> you know working with jimmy and stuff it was like oh here's this thing that we need um for you know this try to have it done you know within a few weeks and i would sit there and oh god you know and um I Googled a lot of things and I reached out and I got a lot of help. And um, that was another thing, I guess, kind of going back to skills in, in the program, you know, and reaching out to people. I was fortunate enough to be able to go to the Esri Users Conference in 2016, which that was the first time I'd ever been able to go. And it was amazing. It was so, so great. And I'm bummed that it's virtual this year, but obviously that's the, the safest decision. But at the expo, I got to know so many people um, out on the floor, like they put their software engineer, or at least when I was there, they put their software engineers on the floor and you go up to them and say, hey, you know, I'm having an issue with, you know, this one, you know, these rasters and it's a lot of rasters and I'm trying to do this, you know, manipulation to them to make them look a certain way. Here's my card, email me. Great. You know? Um, and so I think that's something that's, um, you know, to, to let people know that it's like, you're not alone. Even if you're this one person department, you're not alone. You're, you can reach out, you can, you know, ask for help, advice. Somebody out there has an answer or they're willing to collaborate unless you're working on something that's like, you know, super secret squirrel that you can't actually share the information, but I'm sure that you can find some, which is true. That happened to me where I was like, he's like, send me your data. And I'm like, I can't because it's classified. But, you know, we, we were able to kind of work around that. Um, and I don't know if that speaks to everybody, but for, you know, my personality type, that was like, you have to be perfect and do it right all the time. It's not realistic. So just take that pressure off yourself. It's, it's not going to do anybody any good. Give yourself a stomach ache. And I agree with you, um, being a perpetual learner, even when well, I have three degrees now where I focused yeah. on GIS and mm -hmm. there's still so much for me to learn and not even talking about new things. Um, I can only remember what I use every day and I forget some of the things. So <laughs> some critical thinking skills, hopefully yes. you know, I fill in on some of those, but being able to use Google and other people that I know and mm -hmm. um, looking things up to figure it out and, um, has been really essential for me as an instructor and I'm sure for you in your career as well. Um, and that actually leads to my last question that I'm curious about. Is there anything that you go back and change uh, if you had to do it all over again? I don't know. I thought about this question. My notes. Um, and no, there isn't anything I would do differently. Everything that happened in my GIS career, even in my undergrad, from the minute I stepped foot on this campus in summer of 2001, you know, I was 18, graduated from high school, literally walked on a plane with my trombone, landed, and was like, what am I doing? I would not change a single thing. I really wouldn't. Everything that happened, um, you know, with, yeah, when they pulled, when my first job folded, went into retail, went into, you know, these other careers, it all happened for, you know, it all happened the way it needed to happen for me. And I think for me, my personal growth, my professional growth, fostering these relationships, you know, that I've had with everybody has just been so wonderful and, and great that there really isn't anything that I would change. And yeah, sorry, I don't know if there was <laughs> anything like profound, but yeah. Well, Elspeth, I think you have made it a profound podcast for us by highlighting. Oh, that's a good the, thing. <laughs> no, but you have by highlighting the importance of lifelong learning, by highlighting the importance of networking, um, by highlighting the importance of having a positive attitude and trying to continue to develop yourself. I mean, to me, you're a you know you're a symbol of what to do right in in this in this community. And I like to point to you as one of our success, successful alumni that, you know, oh, we, all, we all have our different paths and, you know, we're going to make errors, but if you stay positive and keep working the networks, keep trying to learn, 
good things will come you know, uh, to, to most. Yeah, don't spin your wheels. You know, I, t I tell people that at my job too, you know, it's either in life, you know, if you feel like you need to, you know, try something else, just don't sit there and create a cloud of smoke. Just keep going mm -hmm. with whatever yeah. it is. Yeah. Well, thanks. I appreciate that. I try, yeah. you know, yeah, definitely not a linear path for me. That's okay. <laughs> no, that's fine. I think we all choose what the taking the long road um, is always better because you get to see more um, and be the geographer rather than taking the shortcuts. That's a good one. <laughs> I like what you did there. <laughs> so thank you for joining us today, Elizabeth, um, on our podcast for the UAGIST program. And it's great to see you again. And we look forward to seeing you at future you. UAGIST well, events. I appreciate you. you guys having me and asking me to come on and do this. Thank you.